Good morning and welcome to Springwood Church. Welcome to the Springwood members, to the Springwood kids and to visitors. We're delighted you're here. And if you're here for the, the very first time, then you are particularly welcome. Please do get in touch with us. My name is Aaron Johnson. I'm the pastor of Springwood Church. And today we'll be continuing our studies on the amazing cross as we race towards Easter. I'm grateful that Warwick Martin from Woodlands Evangelical Church will be teaching us today on the subject of the headless snake, that is, Satan, the defeated enemy. Well, first we'll read from the, the scriptures. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 in your Bible. Reading from verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This Jesus, this wonderful saviour, he, he scorned the shame of the cross. He endured the cross for the joy set before him, and his joy is you, so that he could present your soul safe forever to Almighty God, clean, washed of all your sin, Jesus endured the cross. His joy is you. That's how much he loves you. What a wonderful saviour. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that the Lord Jesus did endure the cross. He scorned its shame and he, for the joy set before him and his joy was ordinary insignificant small sinful people like us thank you lord that love took jesus to the cross thank you father he's a wonderful savior holy spirit please would you be with us this morning encourage our hearts and help us to press on to run the race that's set before us to the glory and honor of jesus we pray amen in a moment, we're going to sing the new song that we learned last week, and I Can Only Imagine, which points us towards heaven. But first, we'll sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace is surely the world's best-known hymn, written, of course, by John Newton over 200 years ago. John Newton was a slave trader, and he was caught up in a violent storm at sea one night, and he pleaded to God to save him. Well, God did save him, and Newton changed and left that shameful lifestyle forever as he chose to follow the Lord Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like John Newton. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Let's stand and sing if you're able. Amazing grace then, I can only imagine.
can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or the more of you be still? Will I stand in the presence? To my knees will I before the Lord our God in prayer now. We're going to pray for Woodlands Church. Woodlands Church are going through some changes. They are wanting to appoint a new member of staff to look after their, their afternoon congregation, which is an outreach service. Um, they want to appoint somebody for that and also to oversee evangelism. So we'll pray for Woodlands Church. But first, we're, we're going to pray for uh, for the country of Nigeria. You may remember that back in 2014, 276 schoolgirls were captured by Boko Haram through the, the militants in the northern state of Chibuk in northeast Nigeria. Many of those girls have since been found, have escaped or been rescued by the army, but a hundred are still missing. But the, the kidnappings continue. On the 17th of February, just last month, unidentified gunmen, gunmen captured 42 people, 22 students and 15 adults. One of the kids was killed in an overnight attack at a boarding school in Kagara in north central state of, of Nigeria. Those hostages are still in captivity. But then on the 26th of February, just last Friday, in a third kidnapping, 317 schoolgirls were abducted from the, the town of, of Janjibi in northwest Nigeria. Now, praise God, most of those kids have been released. So we're going to pray. Let's pray to Almighty God. Ask for his help in these situations. Almighty God, we praise you that we can come before you now. The sovereign God, the God who rules over heaven and earth, welcomes people like us into your presence because Jesus died for us and we are cloaked in his righteousness. Thank you, Father God, that you are the eternal one, the all-powerful one, the almighty God, and the God who is ever expanding your kingdom. Father, we pray that your church would, would grow and be built in this great city of Derby for the glory of Jesus. Lord God, we want to pray for the schools that are returning tomorrow. Thank you, Lord, that the schools are returning. Thank you for all the parents who've worked so hard over these last months to teach their kids. Bless them for it, Lord God. And Father, we pray for the kids as they, they return. Some will be anxious, so would you calm their hearts, please? Father, we pray for the teachers who've done such a fantastic job. Please be with them as they welcome the kids back in. Lord, we pray that you'd keep them safe from the virus so that the kids wouldn't transmit any uh, picked up virus as they return home. Lord, bless the school and education system, we pray. Father, I want to pray for Woodlands Church, give them guidance as they advertise for a, another full-time pastor to look after the afternoon congregation. Lord, would you show them clearly who is the right man and bring him to Woodlands and give them wisdom, Lord, as they sift through the applications. Father, we pray for guidance for future decisions. They've got some big things in terms of the website and social media, key team leaders to fill in. 
And Lord, would you help them as they invest in a cross-cultural mission opportunity? Lord, they need your guidance and your wisdom as they make decisions for the future. Bless them. And Father, we pray for wisdom and creativity for the Easter evangelism. Would that draw many people to hear about Jesus Christ? And Father, many of the congregation, just like ours, are weary after lockdown. Some are fearful. Bless them, Lord. Comfort them and sustain them and restore them, we pray, for your glory. Lord God, we want to pray for the the uh, these kidnappings in Nigeria. Lord, for those hundred that are still missing from 2014, Lord, would you have mercy upon them, please. We pray, Father, that they would be released and restored to their families. Father, would you protect those who are still in captivity? Lord, we pray that you'd comfort their grieving families. Would you help the army and the police to find these missing kids? And Lord, would you take the evil out of the hearts of the members of Boko Haram and would they see Jesus and know him and become people of love instead of hate. Lord we pray that Jesus Christ would be glorified in that nation for Jesus is worthy of their praise. Amen. Well we're going to sing again now we're going to sing the song Cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.
Well, Warwick's going to come and teach us now from God's word. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Remember, he's going to teach on the headless snake, Satan, the defeated enemy. And he'll be basing some of what he says on Ephesians chapter 6. So, reading from verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be, be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckle round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. This is God's word. And when God's word is read, he speaks to us, doesn't he? Bless his holy name. Let's pray for Warwick. Father God, we thank you for, for Warwick. We thank you for the other leaders at Woodlands who, who give, give so much of themselves for us here at Springwood. Bless them for it, Lord. Father, would you be with Warwick as he teaches? Thank you, Lord, for his hard work and his, his love and his dedication to you as he, as he served us well this week. Bless him and help him, Lord, and give us years to hear and encourage our hearts, we pray, for the glory and honour of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name's Warwick. I'm one of the leaders at Woodlands Church, and it's great to be with you again. Many thanks for inviting me back. Let's pray as we begin and ask for God's help. Father God, we thank you for your word, for the sword of the Spirit, and I pray that you would help me now to rightly handle your word to rightly handle that sword. Lord, by your spirit, would you help us understand and, and equip us and help us to live faithfully for the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we are in a battle, a battle against a dangerous enemy who prowls around us like a roaring lion, who uses both pain and pleasure to blind and to weaken faith and to divide, who wants to make us miserable for all eternity. The Bible calls him the prince of this world, the god of this age, the deceiver of the whole world, the accuser, the father of lies, the devil, Satan, that rebellious angel whom God threw out of heaven. For many people today, of course, just a fiction, a cartoon character with a pointy fork. But God tells us that he's very real and we are in a spiritual battle with him. But as we will think about today, while Satan is dangerous, he is defeated and he is doomed. And so we needn't fear if we are trusting Jesus because we are on the winning side. Let me read an extract to you from The Amazing Cross. Uh, it's a story about a missionary couple and their life in the jungle that illustrates brilliantly uh, what's happened to the devil. So here we go. One day, an enormous snake, much longer than a man, slithered its way right through their front door and into the kitchen of their simple home. Terrified, they ran outside and searched frantically for a local who might know what to do. A machete-wielding neighbour came to the rescue, calmly marching into their house and decapitating the snake with one clean chop. The neighbour re-emerged, triumphant, and assured the missionaries that the reptile had been defeated. But there was a catch, he warned. It was going to take a while for the snake to realise it was dead. For the next several hours, the missionaries were forced to wait outside while the snake thrashed about, 
smashing furniture and flailing against walls and windows, wreaking havoc until its body finally understood that it no longer had a head. Do you see? asked the missionary. Satan is a lot like that big old snake. He's already been defeated. He just doesn't know it yet. And in the meantime, he's going to do some damage. But never forget that he's a goner. It's a great story, isn't it? The devil's a goner which of course was predicted right from the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, that that pivotal chapter that explains why this world is so broken. As the devil tempted Adam and Eve, challenging God's goodness by twisting his words, challenging God's truthfulness, excuse me, by casting doubt on the consequences of disobeying God, and of course zeroing in on Adam and Eve's weaknesses and tempting them, which they succumbed to. And rebelled against God, as we all still do today, especially as the devil still using the same deceitful tactics and lies. However, though God allowed the devil's schemes as part of his great salvation plan, he also announced Satan's defeat. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first promise of the gospel, God says to the serpent, the devil, I will put enmity, that is opposition, between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. In other words, there's going to be ongoing opposition and hostility between the devil and humanity, which of course we see. But as God refers to the woman's offspring in relation to the devil, he says, verse 15, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That is, one day the devil will be crushed by the seed of a woman, a human being, though it will come at a great cost to that individual. The devil will strike his heel. And of course, that was fulfilled by the Lord Jesus. For at the cross, Jesus, born of a woman, conquered the devil and rose again in victory. So if you just turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, you'll see Paul explain it. So Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 13, Paul says, He, that's God, forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. (coughs) In other words, as Jesus swapped places with us and was punished for our sin, so God's wrath was satisfied. God's charges against us were cancelled and our sins were forgiven. And as our sin was dealt with, so Satan's power was disarmed and we are no longer in his grip. No wonder then that Paul uses an image here of total victory. Apparently, when heroes returned from battle, they led the captives in a victory procession. And here in Colossians, Paul pictures Jesus doing just that leading Satan and his demons in a victory parade, them being defeated, stripped of their powers, led in shame and forced to submit to the victory of Jesus. It's a great picture, isn't it? The crucified, risen Jesus defeated Satan. And as he did, so he also broke Satan's power over death, as Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 tells us. Death couldn't hold Jesus and it won't hold us either. Satan is defeated. But hang on a minute, if Satan's defeated, why is our spiritual battle still raging? Although we don't know fully why, God's word gives us a couple of answers. So first, because of God's patience. You see, at the end of time when Jesus returns, the devil will be banished forever. But of course, Jesus hasn't come back yet. 
And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Peter explains why. He says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is wonderfully patient, delaying Christ's return so that those he's chosen have time to hear the good news and turn to Jesus. And I praise God for his patience. I praise God that Jesus didn't come back 40 or so years ago because otherwise I'd have been lost. And so for those that we know and love who don't yet know Jesus, well, there's still time. He hasn't returned yet. So let's keep praying for them. So God is patient. He's patient. And until Jesus returns and banishes the devil forever, that headless snake, the devil, will keep thrashing about and warring against us. Secondly, Satan's still active because God permits evil to refine our faith. In Peter's first letter, he writes to encourage his readers in their struggles. He says, sometimes God finds it necessary for us to be grieved by trials, not because he delights to see us suffer, but because there is a good purpose in them. Verse 7, in regard to these struggles, he says, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter compares our faith to gold purified by fire. As the gold goes through the fire in a crucible, so the dross is burned away, leaving the gold purer and shining brightly. Likewise, as we go through fiery trials that test our faith, our sinful dross is burned away and our faith emerges purer and shining more brightly and shown to be genuine. Part of our preparation then for heaven is this refining process. So God permits evil uh, for a while to grow us more like Jesus and that we be ready to receive that glorious inheritance kept safely in heaven for us. But let's be clear, Satan might still be causing damage, but his power is limited. God is still sovereign and the only authority Satan has is what is given to him by God, which of course God is ultimately using for good, as we've just seen with those verses in 1 Peter. You know, the other day I was playing football with my son Joshua in the park when this dog ran up and nicked one of the cones that we were using as goalposts. Eventually, after watching, uh, watching me fail countless times, to get it back from the dog, well, the owner finally intervened and we got the cone back. And then the dog was put on a leash. Suddenly, it was restricted where it could go and what it could do. It was free only to do what its owner permitted. Now, likewise, Satan is on a leash and he is free only to do what God permits. In fact, he has to get God's permission. So, for example, in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Simon says, to, uh, sorry, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. God allowed Simon Peter's faith to be tested to prove that it was genuine. But you see, you see how Satan is on a leash. And we won't face his attacks forever. One day they will end, as Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 reveals, when the devil is thrown into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever. No more Satan. No more evil. Won't it be wonderful not to be tempted, not to be targeted, not to have to endure his trials anymore. The devil's total defeat is coming. It is sure. It is certain. And of course, when Jesus cast out evil spirits and he conquered death, well, that was a guarantee of that. A taste of the perfect new world to come 
when Jesus returns and there will be no more evil. For now, though, Satan has a role to play in God's good purposes for the world. So he's behind the persecution of Christians in some countries. In our society, well, his ways are more subtle. He blinds the eyes of unbelievers so they can't see how precious the gospel is. For us, uh, he loves to deceive us with lies about God's goodness, especially when we're going through difficult times, or lies about the truth of God's word, or lies about our eternal security. He reminds us of past sins to make us feel guilty and powerless to serve. He accuses us before God. But thankfully, Jesus is our advocate in heaven who always lives to intercede for us. And of course, Satan is the great tempter, tempting us to treasure, of the, to treasure the things of this world and not the kingdom of heaven, tempting us to sin as he did successfully with Judas. Satan sends his followers into churches masquerading as leaders, but they are nothing more than wolves in sheep's clothing who won't spare the flock. And the devil loves to pluck the word out of people's hearts and choke faith. And he hates evangelism and discipleship and mission. You know, I have lost track of the times when something has gone wrong just before I've done an evangelistic event. So, for example, my wife had to pull out of a senior citizen's evangelistic tea as we were about to start because we got a call telling us that a child had broken my son's wrist at nursery. I was nearly assaulted before uh, another evangelistic event at, a, at one holiday club service that I did. My memory stick with all the key information on it vanished just before we started and then suddenly reappeared shortly after the service and so on. Satan's got all sorts of strategies to derail our faith and our mission. And so we face two realities. We belong to Jesus and Satan's defeated, but Satan is still at war with us and we need to protect ourselves. So finally then, how do we do that? How do we actively resist the devil's schemes? Well, here's some thoughts. First, remember Satan's limitations. We've already said his powers are limited, but remember too that Satan has no claim on us. As Paul assures us in Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So the devil can't harm us in any ultimate sense if we are in Christ if our lives are hidden in Christ. Secondly, let's guard ourselves against our weaknesses and temptations. As J.C. Ryle, the Anglican bishop, helpfully put it, temptation to sin rarely presents itself in its true colours, saying, I'm your deadly enemy and I want to ruin you forever in hell. No, sin comes to us like Judas with a kiss. The forbidden fruit seemed good and desirable to Eve, and yet it cast her out of Eden. The devil is the great deceiver. He knows our weaknesses, he knows our temptations, do we? How is the devil tempting us now in our lives? We need to think about that, we need to be alert to those temptations. We need to be alert to our weaknesses, weaknesses so we can work out how we strengthen those weaknesses and guard ourselves from the devil's attacks. Always remembering, though, that the devil's power is limited and we don't have to give in to his schemes because we are no longer slaves to sin. And then thirdly, of course, we must pray. What did our saviour teach us to pray? Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We need to pray. We need to pray for God's protection and his deliverance from the evil one. Next, we need to put sinful deeds to death. 
We need to put sinful deeds to death. John Owen, the, the, uh, the famous church leader and theologian, said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. We need to kill it, not just by saying no, but also by setting our minds on the things of the spirit. That is setting our minds on God's word. Because as we do, we can wield the sword of the spirit, as Paul calls God's word in Ephesians 6. And we can kill that sin, which is vital, not just to honour God, but also so that we don't give Satan a way into our relationships or a way into the church. For example, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Satan wants nothing more than to stop people becoming Christians or living as Christians. Nothing more than to disrupt God's church. So when we're angry or unkind to one another or we slander others or or we don't bear with one another, it gives him a foothold to get in and divide us and destroy us. And so we need to put anger to death. We need to build up other Christians and not tear them down so that the devil cannot get a foothold. He can't get in. We need to put sinful deeds to death. And then lastly, as you heard read in Ephesians 6, we need to put on God's armour. As I say, that's the passage that you heard read earlier, where Paul urges his readers to clothe themselves in God's protection each and every day so that they can withstand the devil's attacks. We need to put on the truth and righteousness of Jesus so that we're not taken in by the devil's lies, you know, like, God doesn't love us or we're not as good as others or or that God owes us because we follow him. What lies is the devil telling us at the moment? Stand strong against them. We need to be ready with the sandals of peace on, ready to stand strong for Jesus and to share the good news. We need to grasp the shield of faith, hold tight to God's wonderful promises, to protect us, trust those promises, hold tight to them. We need to put on the certainty of our salvation, that Jesus has done everything to put us right with God, so that we don't doubt, so the devil would love us to doubt Jesus and what we have in him. And we need to wield the sword of the Spirit, go on the attack by reading God's word and relying on prayer. Do take a closer look at God's armour later. I've barely scratched the surface. I don't have time now. But if we put that armour on, we will have God's strength to resist the devil. So friends, this week, as that headless snake seeks to destroy us, fight, but don't fear, because Satan is defeated. His authority is limited, totally subordinate to God's will, and Satan is doomed, headed for that lake of fire. Defeated, doomed, but for now still dangerous. So guard yourselves against weakness and temptation. Pray for God's help. Put sinful deeds to death through the Spirit and get that armour on and stand strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, fighting the good fight, because through the blood of Jesus, we will overcome. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you that in the Lord Jesus, we have the victory, victory over death, victory over Satan. Lord, please, we pray, would you help us to stay alert, help us to clothe ourselves in your protection, and we pray that you would Guard us and keep us safe. Help us to resist Satan and to build your kingdom and to make every effort, Lord, to live holy and godly lives as we look forward to our Saviour's return. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for teaching us so well, Warwick. So be encouraged, folks. Be encouraged that Satan is real. So we need to pray for protection from him every day. Praise God, though, that he really is a defeated enemy. There is only one on the throne, and that's Jesus Christ. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. If you've got any questions about what we've been teaching, or indeed any questions about God and how to be right with them, please get in touch with us. Get in touch through our Facebook page, Springwood Church Derby, through our website, www.springwoodchurch.org.uk. And if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. It would be really helpful if you could tell us where you're located. That will help us in our future planning. So just in the comments box or, or drop us an email. Tell us roughly where you are, please. Our closing song is Before the Throne of God, remembering that Satan is this headless snake, the defeated enemy, our closing song, Before the Throne of God, where the second verse says, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, Upward, I'll look and see him there, that's Jesus, who made an end of all my sin. Because my sinless saviour died, my soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is greater of his hands. My name Yeah.